five, four, three, two, one. Hello, YouTube, and welcome to this special episode on Video Code. On today's podcast, we have Emmanuel Jolaya, who's going to be walking us through everything about geographic information systems and how that relates to software development and also his background and his interest and passion in this field. And we'll also go through the different technologies that are actually used for this. And some of them will actually be very familiar to you. And now I'll pass it on to Emmanuel to give us a quick introduction uh, about himself. And then uh, we'll go from there. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Emmanuel Jolaya and I'm a GIS developer, a special interest in community development, like community development so much. So yeah, I, I love to dance, I love to eat the gym, and I love to play table tennis. <laughs> so that, that's myself. <laughs> um, now let's see with, uh, with uh, GIS, how exactly did this spark your interest? Like what exactly, you know, is there in GIS? Because it's not something that people really think of a lot when they think of tech or coding. Yeah, you know, the, the thing about GIS is, when someone asks me what GIS is, I say, GIS is just a technology for you to make your life easier. I don't go into details. I tell them with GIS, you can make your life easier. You can solve problems. You understand? It's a very, very interesting technology. That yeah. when you and you get the most out of it, you'll be happy with it. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Say, for example, we have OP, OP that we are all familiar with. We have Uber, you know, the self driving vehicles and the likes. Mm -hmm. People don't really talk about the GIS components, the geospatial components part. What we see is the software engineering and the likes. But most of these organizations, they have the GIS development department, you understand? So that, that, that act as the backbone of most of their technology out there, most of the software out there. So GIS is like a transformational technology that exists to make our work easier. Data is at the core of GIS, and this data is special data. That is, it has a particular location. And what does that mean? It has uh, a latitude and a longitude. Understand? It is a different thing to know what is happening somewhere or what is happening maybe through data or something. And with GIS, you can get to know where something is happening. You know? Okay. For example, now if I ask you about traffic congestion in Nigeria. Yeah. The person that provides is Lagos. <laughs> you understand? And when you also talk about Lagos too, when we ask you about traffic congestion in Lagos, mm -hmm. you also mentioned some locations in Lagos where these traffic issues happen. Yeah. So these are what GIS helps us to understand. You know, it gives us insight into this mm -hmm. environmental pressing issues. And yeah. it also helps us, you know, provide ways for us that which you can can solve this problem. So GIS is very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's really interesting. You know, even just uh, to your points, like when you look at apps like Uber, Ope, you know, there's all this, uh, there are maps there and, you know, people aren't really thinking of, okay, how are those layers on the maps drawn? How, you know, how 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 do we think of the latitude and longitude? How is that car, how, you know, how is the car able to um, um, update live on the map? So you know, if, um, before before we get into some of the details, how did you get into tech itself? So now um, the, there's the interest in uh, the geospatial world and GIS. How then did you get into tech? What kind of skills did you have to uh, learn in order to uh, be successful at what you've been doing? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question because actually GIS itself is tech. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, GIS is tech itself. So. It, I think, let me just show you a short story map I, 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 I made with uh, a GIS software. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yeah. So this is a short story map that's, you know, designed to share my career journey in GIS. So, so it all started in 2015 when I got admission into FUTA. <laughs> Nice. You know, you know. Th thankfully, then I, I should be thanking Futa actually because what I chose then was actually electrical electronics. <laughs> you know, I was so passionate about electrical electronics. You know, let's do this and that, join wire together, do connections, direct current, alternating current. So super interesting and fun then. You know, and you know, 
as we you know the way we think there was oh, was not really much sure so i wrote my jam i chose electric electronics it was jam electric electronics you know i was choosing those those courses but i don't know if i should even say it's unfortunate because it's kind of fortunate for me mm. but then Futsal gave me remote sensing and gis so and you know, I, I didn't know what it is about. I, in, my, in fact, I was about losing interest. Like maybe I should just wait and let's try it um, at home. But I was like, um, let me just put in my best into this course because I read a lot about it. Actually, I read a lot. I met people. You know, then I was book home. I, I read a lot. <laughs> what I mean, read a lot. I read a lot. See my face here. <laughs> this is only a. Like, I bobbed my hair so low that I just want fresh air in that mentality, fresh air, so I can read and read and read. <laughs> so I just got, I know it's footer, footer was very difficult then. So I was just consuming book, going online, reading about GIS. Mm -hmm. And what, what's kind of more interesting about it then was when my parents asked me my course, I, I had to start explaining yeah. on like some courses like doctor, you know, medicine, um, architect. You don't need to explain to people what you're studying. When my parents asked me, I had to start explaining. And it's kind of, it wasn't interesting, <laughs> actually. So I had to look, you know, read a lot to see ways where I can be able to break it down to them so they can understand what I, what I do. Sometimes I tell them I, I'm studying advanced geography. Sometimes I tell them I'm studying geology. Because <laughs> if, they, if they just start going into details, it's, yeah. it, it, we can use like 30 <laughs> minutes just to tell them about my course. So I just have to read a lot so I can get to understand what GIS means itself. So when I'm explaining to people, I ensure that, okay, people get what I'm trying to say. So, you know, I, I met with people when I was in 200 level. I, because I, I believe, I, I know it was very strange to me then. So I just had to network with people that I know are doing great with this GIS. So there's this guy, Dennis Ray. Anytime I go to school for my class to read, I always see him with his laptop, you know, punching his keyboard, keypad. No, you know how those tech guys used to yeah, do yeah. medicine. So yeah, you know, I I I I, I just I I um, I approached him, and you know, he put me through some stuffs. In fact, it was a metrology department. That, that was then. It was a metrology department, and he also had interest in GIS, and even I. GIS department, I don't even know what GIS is there, yeah. but more of developing interest in it. So it puts me through some stuff, you know, use mapping, collaborating, and co contributing to humanitarian activities. He opened my eyes towards some, you know, what I can use GIS for. And, you know, I met with this guy as well. I did go with Daniel. He was, he was the president then, the department. So I just went to him as the president. So this GIS of its thing. Please, so <laughs> how can I, you know, because this is a five year course now, so I don't want to waste five years in university. So it was like, you know what, GIS is very interesting, but it's, it's more interesting when you add um, programming to it. You know, he has experience yeah. already. So he said it's more interesting when you add programming to it. So that was even the point where I started, you know, learning programming. So I had to, I had to tell my, my mom that, um, Mom, um, I need the laptop because our course is laptop. You just have to have a laptop. You can't do anything. Assignments, everything is software. So I need the laptop. She got me a laptop. Uh, I got some materials from my guys. I checked YouTube and the likes. So I started with Python. I was learning Python then. Well, you know, as <laughs> I was very unserious then. So um, <laughs> I just stopped learning Python. And I took a break from Python because... This was 2017, and in 2018, the, the work was too much. The workload was very much on myself. So, you know, from Dennis, I got to know about it, my past. So I invested my, much of my time into community development, hosting, big subs and the likes. Yeah. So this was actually how it got started. 2017, that's just 2017. So that was when I started to take. And what I started with was Python. Well, I wasn't so much writing codes. I was more like community development and tech. You need to, I know, teaching people what I know. That's like, for great. example, this picture, I was showing people how to map with OSM. You understand? 
that was what I learned from Dennis Rory when he was posting to his mapping. So I was teaching people how I, uh, how I got to uh, what I learned about his mapping and how it can benefit them. Because you know, we have a chapter in our community, Get My Passporter. So. <laughs> Yeah, and and uh, so OSM, you mentioned OSM. I'm not sure, maybe people in the audience may not uh, be familiar with this. Um, I guess that's OpenStreetMap. How you know where yeah, does that yeah, lead yeah. with things like uh, Uber or um, or Google Maps and and so on? Yeah, OSM is <clears throat> sorry. OSM is OpenStreetMap. So it's just like um, a free and editable map of the world. You understand the map is there for free. You know we have Google Maps. Mm -hmm. So that you know that one is proprietary. So we have the open source version, which is OpenStreetMaps. So let me just show you OpenStreetMap. So this is OSM. You can go there to contribute. For example, if you if you have a new road that, that just got constructed in your street, you can go to OSM to contribute, like to add the road. Wow. To OSM. Understand? It's super easy. If you have a new building, maybe a point of interest that you just uh, that just got constructed, maybe shop right or something, mm -hmm. you can go to OSM to update it. Interesting. You no, know? so OSM is just. Let me show you my university. We, <laughs> I think we've mapped almost everywhere. You can see. Wow. So this, this is my That's institution, cool. for example. We've mapped almost everywhere. Yabola restaurant. These are things you can't see on Google Maps. Yeah. And is this <laughs> so the that there is some very Yabola? <laughs> or this road is so smart than Fulio Road. Or these are baseball courts or you know handball courts in Futa. Mm -hmm. So we have mapped Futa. You know, we have a community in a chapter in Futa. So as a youth mapper, those are part of things we do, we do in um in our community. So we've mapped Futa. So I, I can't do this in, on Google Map. I can't. I don't think I can add polygon in Google Map where I can do some mapping because it's proprietary. But OpenStreetMap allows us to do that kind of stuff. Get to map anywhere you want to map, and you you add it to 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 the map, so people somewhere out there can get to use it. For example, now someone can decide to build a software around this, maybe a navigation software or something. I mean, anybody can just. Use this fence they want to use it for. But you, as a contributor, you have you know, done your part to update the map of the world because there are a lot of places in this world that you don't even know exist, that are not mapped. Yeah. So even if government wants to intervene and you know, maybe help with some development projects, if they don't know where these communities are, <laughs> there's no way they can get to even go there to help them or something. Yeah. So that's why we actually map in OSM. We put those communities on the map. So anybody can get to use the data sets for the different projects they want to use it for development projects and like. Yeah, yeah, that, that's actually very awesome. The fact that through open source uh, technology, you can contribute to um, a map that people use and also, you know, actually um, get some work experience out there. And one of the use cases you just mentioned is uh, for governments to, you know, local governments or maybe states or federal who want to actually get something done in their, um, uh, within their region, they could actually reach out to groups like yours, right, um, uh, the, FUTA, uh, the FUTA team or, and other youth mappers in different locations to actually come up with these maps. And then based on that, you know, someone can actually now build maybe a small version of Uber within your university. Or someone can, you know, uh, come up with um, maybe like a a, uh, a a virtual tour of the campus, you know, things like that with this technology built, which is uh, really exciting. Yeah, seriously, because, you know, as a youth mapper, we, we are kind of have something like that. <laughs> oh, cool. Like, we have put our guide, uh, you know, we just developed the website last, um, during, the, during the corona, you know, break, lockdown, we are like, Futa is well mapped, like almost everything in the school has been mapped. So we like let's just build something around it where we can get to people can get to like fresh house, for example, that have issues with locating where they want to write their exams. Yeah. So I put so I put so I put cry at the end of the day, you know. They come to Futa to write maybe post for example, but they don't know the location of um you know the examination mm -hmm. or 
So they get to miss their exams. Even aside that, those that already got admission as well, they get to miss lectures because they don't know where these locations exist. Mm -hmm. So actually, we have like a static map on the at the entrance of the university, but it's not effective. I mean, you can't be going there every day to, to check where you want to go to next. So that was the idea behind this footer guide. We haven't actually improved on it, but that's the idea behind it. So with this footer guide, you can be able to, I think, you can be able to search for where you want to go. Let's say you want to go from here to another place, School of Veterinary Science, for example. They can get the direction. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to work because we haven't, we haven't really had time to uh, refactor the code or something. But that's just the idea behind it. And we hope to build it um, you know, in the nearest future. So you see how beautiful it is. <laughs> yeah. So we hope to build it in the nearest future to enable using navigation, navigation around the university environment. So that will be more local. What, what we can see on Google Maps, be able to see it on, on this kind of platform. Interesting. So, so where is the satellite? Like, um, uh, the satellites, this, these images, like, how, how do you get access to them? Yeah, so this imagery is from, like, we have some imagery providers that provide yeah. free imagery. Like, Google themselves provide free imagery. Mm -hmm. We have the Google Earth, um let me just show you Google Earth Pro. So this is Google Earth Pro. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. So this is the world. Mm -hmm. So you can look for, let's say, Google Earth Quarter, for example. So the images are like the eyes in the sky. So this is Google Earth Quarters. Yeah. In California. So images are like eyes in the skies. They, they capture the... Um, the world from above. Yeah. Understand? So that's where remote sensing comes in. You know, they work hand in hand, remote sensing and GIS. So these images are captured from maybe satellite imagery or maybe drone imagery, you know, or airborne sensors. Because they are like different platforms for capturing the, the world from above. You can maybe ground based, airborne, drone, um, satellites. So the point is, this imagery is this, they allow us to see the world from above and how they are changing. So, for example, the image you capture um, this year, and maybe you capture another one. Uh, you capture another one next year. You can get to see the differences. Okay, this year, Google Building was here. Google Headquarters was here. Mm -hmm. The next year, it has moved. Maybe it has been demolished. For example, this barren, barren, barren land. There might be some maybe buildings there in the past, maybe a few years ago or something, when you back dates. But now they are no more there. So they allow us to study our world, how the world uh, are changing. And there are different providers of this imagery. That's the base map that you're asking about. Google, this is Google, 2021. They are a provider of this imagery. In fact, the one, the one I showed you, um, yeah, it's from Google. This one. It's from Google. Okay. So there's so a, have a lot of companies that provide imagery. You know, you can't, it's very expensive to launch a satellite in space. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all these, um, you know, big companies that get to do that. So Google provides satellite imagery. This one is particularly from Google. Like, now it's not a the code. So I use Google TMS in this one. Okay. So this is from Google. So we have companies like Digital Globe, which we also called uh, Maxa. They also provide free imagery of the world. We have Bing. We have Esri. They also provide free imagery of the world. But this particular one is from Google. And this imagery allows us to see the world from above so you can get to make some decisions. You know, what you see, you... <laughs> yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, this is something about. So, so, so this website, um, it has some connection to those uh, image providers. How, how exactly um, did you make that connection? And also, what's your website built in? Like, when you're building this website, what, what language or you know, what framework? And then, how did you make that connection to Google's um, APIs? 
All right, that, that's a good question. So, you know those websites I used, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. You know, CSS is for the styling, HTML is for the structure, and JavaScript is for the interaction and everything. So, so you use some GIS components, you know, GIS apps, GIS um, tools in your projects. Yeah, some libraries that made the process easier for us. For example, I used leaflets to bring this map here. You know, this map has been mapped on OSM, so I had to use leaflet library to access OSM to bring it here, and that's with JavaScript. And this style is not how OSM is styled. You know, I show us OSM, this is OSM. You can see the styling of OSM. Yeah. Like how the maps are styled and everything. It's different from this one. Like very different. So yeah. I used map box for this one to style it. Okay. So that's why I had dark mode and light mode. So I used map box to style the dark mode and the light mode. You understand? Then I called it with JavaScript. So that when you click on dark mode, it's add the styling. But the style I use the map box on the on the image. And when I called on uh, light mode, you know, it's yeah. it's more like a toggle button, just like normal DOM manipulation of uh, JavaScript. So that's what I actually did here. So I used Leaflet API to you know bring this map here. I also use Leaflet to add those map box styles to the split on this map. Yeah. Understand? Yeah. So then those imagery as well, I use leaflets. The imagery is actually free. This Google satellite image is actually free. So you can just call it with leaflets. Do you want me to show the code or something? Uh, yeah, we could actually uh, walk with the code too. And then after going through the code, we can then look at uh, the different companies who are um, uh, hiring for uh, GIS roles. Oh, okay, no problem. So, so this, this is the um, repository of the, so these are the libraries I use, leaflets JS, you see. Okay. Then the intro JS starts for the site store. When you actually go to the um, to the site, or this intro, you know, or the store. So that's what I use intro JS for. Then leaflet routing machine. That's what I used for this routing, such that when you search, when you go here and you want to search for, let me just search for um, sense. So self smoke way and seats. So when I now click on this, this seats and sense should be somewhere around there. I don't know. Um, oh man. So yeah, this is supposed to be sense, but the routing is not working anymore. So it's broken. But that's what I used for the routing, the flex routing machine. Then the geo search was what I used, um, was this one, such that when you search for a particular place, it takes you there. So that's why I used the leaflet um, geo search there. The Mapbox Studio was where I did the styling. So this Mapbox Studio, you can get to style, you know, um, you can design beautiful maps, you can style maps right here. Understand? So there are vector ties. So you get to style it the way you want them. And so this Mapbox Studio gives you some URL that you can now attach to, um, you know, attach your code. Okay. So that's why, that's why, let me just see if I can open the JS code and show you. Um, so yeah, this is the dark mode, you see. So this dark mode is coming from Mapbox. Yeah, yeah. So I started this in Mapbox. This light mode as well, I started in, uh, in Mapbox as well. So then this satellite Google imagery. So this one is a uh, XY, XYZ size. Mm -hmm. So this is free as well. It's like this style layer. So... So this is the control. So this control is this one. This one right here, where you get to toggle the satellite on. 
as the control. So this is the switch icon. The one you use to toggle from light mode to dark mode. This is the code base that does the whole, the whole logic here. So this is the geolocation where you get to um, you know, search for a particular place and fly to the place. So then there's some parameters that are used to limit the geo-searching around footer. So if you search for any place around footer, you won't get it. So this thing has, this code has limited it to, to footer environment. So, you know, and, and some normal JavaScript codes just to ensure this thing works. So, yeah. but you know, we are using open source too, and this leaflet, you know, this routing machine do have some issues. Like sometimes it won't work, sometimes it's to work. Like it's 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 break it breaks. So this is it. you can see the OSRM demo server appears down or network error code. So I don't know what's wrong with it. I ran into a lot of issues when I was even developing the code. And this is like the only open source version I could use. The others I wanted to pay. And if I say I should use, my, my box also has a free version and like you can route, use the geocoding library to route in a route machine and direction, they call it direction API or something. But it's not local, like I can't search for Yabola, for example, with your own direction, direction API. It's not going to show anything, you understand? Yeah. So it's only that leaflet routing machine that allows me to be able to search, you know, access data from OSM, such that I can search for like this CC, for example, it's like a walkway in footer, uh, in footer, right? If you're not a footer, you won't know it. So these things are not on the you know, general maps out there, all this Jibo annex, all this local data that we added on OSM. So that's why I just had to use this routing machine. So it's, it has a lot of issues, Sha. That's even why this was not working at the moment. Because <laughs> yeah. it's works well when I developed it. Yeah, this is one of the, uh, um, you know, the trade-offs in general, open source uh, dependencies versus uh, using dependencies from uh, proprietary companies. But then even speaking of, about companies, what are some of the job opportunities in GIS, both in Africa and, you know, internationally? Where, where are some of these job opportunities uh, for anyone who wants to get into GIS? Yeah, there are a lot of job opportunities in GIS. Let me just show you this map. This GIS jobs map. Find it online. It's, it's a very nice resource. So you get to see jobs all around the world. Yeah, this, this is uh this is pretty cool. And it's also innovative. They're using they're using maps. <laughs> yeah, so if you want if you have interest in working in the in the States, just go there and look for jobs in there. You understand? So you get to see the locations and so these are GIS jobs. If you click on one, so it was posted two days ago. Supervisory wow. geographer, US Department of Commerce in the United States. So you read it and if you want to apply, read everything, be on Indeed, and you know, go ahead to apply. So there are a lot of jobs in GIS. The jobs are just there, a lot. A lot of jobs. You can never go stranded with GIS. And even aside applying for all these jobs, even yourself, when you are innovative, this one is posted today, Romania. So when you are innovative, you you get to use JS to solve pressing problems. Like maybe let's say for example, you have interest in agriculture. You can use JS in agriculture. Maybe your your dad has farm somewhere, or even yourself, you want to start you know farming, going into agriculture, you know, for food security. SDG go to. You can apply GIS in it for precision farming. You can we use GIS to analyze the appropriate place to plant some maize, to plant some crops, for example, to plant cassava, to plant this and that. You can use GIS to monitor it, the growth rates. You know, this, like, let me just show you some. The GIS is very interesting. Like, yeah. I think I, let me just show you this one of the applications of GIS that interests me. Uh, and that's the word on gamma. When I saw this, <laughs> when I saw this map, I was super interested, impressed. Like, this is dope. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. 
So it, is, it a static, is it a static map or uh, is, is it? Uh, it's not a static a map. It's a very interactive map, not static okay. at all. You know, that, that was most of the applications out there uses WebGIS. Board on Gamma. Um, uh, so putting JS on the web, yeah, I think that's it. Putting JS on the web is, is very interesting when you, uh, yeah, this is it. So this is very beautiful. <laughs> so by looking at this, you can make some interesting decisions, even as a government official, organization, you know, individual, you can make some interesting decisions, you know, get to see the Onga map of, the, like, this is just so amazing and very interactive, death rates. Also, there's COVID-19 cases as well. So, this, so when you have an idea or knowledge of what GIS can do, you get to innovate and build something amazing. You understand? So even aside these jobs that we get to see on these maps, you know, working for organizations, which is very cool, yourself can be innovative and solve problems. What we have after in this world is to solve problems. All organizations exist to solve problems. Yeah. And of course, make profit as well. But if you can get to solve problems, I mean, why not? Look at this guy, just NG. I know you know them. There are some problems with GIS. You know, I was privileged to work with them um, during my IT for one of their projects. So the self-direction problem, they ask you where would you like to go today. If I say, I'm not based in Lagos, so let me just say Surulere. Surulere. Uh, so, so this is more like interactive um, Google map. <laughs> Okay, interesting. When you get to chat a bot and the bot will reply to you some directions to where you like to go to. You understand? So this innovation. Yeah. Is yeah. Like a very cool thing. And yeah. there are a lot of startups like that that are doing something amazing with GIS. Some are using GIS, but it's at the back end, which we don't get to hear of. You know, for example, banking industry, they they have customers across the nation, you understand? And they go to the uh, so these customers' addresses, maybe to, for confirmation. I, I think it was yesterday I was at the bank for something and they asked for my address or, or Nepal bill, was it, was it Nepal bill? So I, I gave them the one I, I use at home that's in about the Nepal bill. And they were like, they want the one in Accra because they'll pay a visit to confirm where I stay. Understand this is that things GIS can solve. Yeah. So so they want that's in order to verify where you live. Yeah, they, they also verify my address. You understand? <laughs> so see, why why is stress? So I didn't think we have this this country is you know we are gonna get it actually. We have a database of everybody, their locations and everything. It's just so easy. When I come to the bank, I give them my BVN for, for Christ's sake. My BVN, I give it to them, I give them my NIN, that's still not enough. They still had to ask for Nepal bill. So they can come to my house to verify that I actually stay there. <laughs> so I didn't mean we have a very strong GIS system in this world, in this part of the world. It's just by punching my BBN or my NIN, any of the two, they see my location straight up, then they move on. Interesting. So this, like GIS can just be integrated into all the all the industry. Look at the telecommunication, for example. Mm -hmm. Before you cite a mast, there are some um, there are some policies that you need to abide by. You know, you can't cite a mast, that's um, telecom mast. I think it's 20 meter. Like the distance between a mast and a building, that's residential building, should be 20 meters. I think according, according to FEMA, um, I can't really remember, but it's around 20 meters or 10 meters. So and that, you want to start measuring 20 meters before you start um, setting mast. So these are things you can easily do with GIS. There's, some, there's something we call buffer in GIS. Buffer. buffer is just more like um, you know, drawing a, 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 an artificial boundary around, the, a, around a feature, maybe a point, a line, or polygon. So with buffering analysis, you can easily know 
houses or buildings or regions that are you know, violating the 20 meter rule. So let's say you have a mast in a particular area, just draw a buffer of 20 meters around it. It's going to draw like, a, you know, curve like an uh, artificial circle mm -hmm. around that area. Mm -hmm. Then you overlay it on, you know, overlay buildings of that area on it. Or maybe go to OSM, download OSM buildings. You know, that's an application of OSM. You can go there to download buildings or map buildings. Overlay it on your GIS software. You get to see buildings that are, you know, overlapping in the both or um, both buffering zone. So you can move on from there, move ahead, make informed decisions. Maybe you move your mouse master away from there, or you go there to tell them of the adverse effect of them citing masts um, around uh, them building their house around and the communication yeah. mast. You understand? Even for monitoring of these masts, you can combine JS with IoT such that you get to know the status of your mast. The diesel there is it uh, like the diesel level? You know, they, they, they use diesel to fuel these masts. So is it reducing, like, is it reduced? Is it finished? So you can go there to refill it. So you wouldn't need to be sending your operate, operation engineers to be going there to check for you every time. Just have a dashboard, IoT, GIS, add location to it. So you get to see the mask that has, has um, faults or the mask that needs to, you know, need servicing or needs to be refilled with diesel or something. Look at ATMs. Before you cite ATM, you need to understand where you want to cite it. You need to understand your community, your environment. You can't just come and put ATM in my lodge. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so, <laughs> so, so if I get one of the one of the main benefits of GIS is you know this real time, you know, being able to to plan ahead of time and then to get yeah. real time. So with in combination with IoT. Yeah, that's IoT for real time. So GIS can just be combined into a lot of tech. Yeah. Even IoT you can use in agriculture. You can monitor your farm in real time. You can add, you can even add AI to that. So <laughs> such that when you have a farm and you're monitoring your farm, you can do such that those IoT devices can capture your farm, your know, pictures of your farm, of your crops, such that you are going to embed an AI model there. So if maybe there's, uh, maybe your, one of your crop is not LD or maybe there's a pest or something on your crop, when the AI, IoT captures it, the AI model will recognize that, <laughs> yeah. that, that uh, infected crop. Then on your own end, you know the location because, of course, you have added GI, so you get the location of that um, crop, affected oh. crop. Get the seeds oh. from your hand. So even when you come to your farm, if your farm is very big, you don't need to start moving around your farm to know which one is affected. Mm -hmm. You already have the location of, of the affected pest, uh, affected crop with you. you. Just go there straight, apply your pesticide or fertilizer or something, so this GIS is just, it's, it's, it's just to just make our life easier, but they are not seeing it in this part of the world. You understand? Well, and well, it's really, uh, really encouraging. GIS is very, very interesting. You can, like, it's like at the core, at the core of all, all technologies, because in everything you do, location matters. Mm -hmm. In everything you do, location matters. You can't say you want to start a business and go and site your business beside a landfill or a dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't yeah. make sense, right? Yeah. So you need to, you know, consider the location. Or you can't go and put your business in a remote location. You need to put it in a place that is close to the market. That's why Lagos is today concentrated because people want to put their businesses, their hub, in a place where the needs can benefit them. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Where the value chain, whatever they need, is, is near them. The proximity is so close. So... GIS is just, it helps in making informed decisions. Like, yeah. I don't even want to start talking about environments, how it can help us mitigate floods and disasters. Maybe the reason is because um, we are not really experiencing much disasters here. That's why we are not taking the flooding yeah. and GIS seriously. Because if um, we take GIS seriously, it's going to mitigate the flooding event that is happening in the country. You know, I stay in Ibadan, so I know how flooded Ibadan is. Huh. Mm -hmm. Even my house, anytime it rains, I think we are not always happy because rain really surely and um, starts, you know, washing everything, starts. So it's really annoying. It's not really encouraging. So these are things giants can solve. You want to build road, you want to construct road. You should know you should add drainage there. I mean, these are things giants can help to mitigate, plan. It's not after it has happened before we start solving it. 
we see beyond it. Mm -hmm. So GIS is very interesting. Lots can you yourself can even aside working in organizations, you can innovate. Just look at there's nothing you can apply GIS to. Name it finance, agriculture, business, military. You know, if you apply GIS, I know our, our military just do probably be using GIS. You know, for yeah. combating uh, insurgency and the likes. But uh, I believe if truly are using GIS, we shouldn't still be having um, the you know crisis we are still facing in this country. Because GIS would have helped to reduce it to the greatest minimum. Because you know, with remote sensing and GIS, you get to see your enemy where they are situated. And you, if you want to launch your strike, you launch it. If you want to maybe attack on the ground, you, you attack. Look at navigation. You know, you can ship, um, ship navigation. But GIS is very interesting. Like, I don't even know what else to yeah. say because yeah. I can't even look at, I can't say this in a particular field. You can't apply GIS. The only field I'm kind of still having uh, to think a lot about is education. I can apply GIS in education. I know, I know you can use GIS to, you know, select suitable sites to, to um, build your schools. Yeah. Well, I mean, education is learning. How you can use GIS to, to learn. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I actually um, figured was you can also use GIS to teach. Like the story map I was showing you, this is a story map and it's one of the GIS components. If I proceed with it, you get to see a lot about my story, about my life. So this is telling stories through true maps, you know? So GIS is super interesting, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I, ju I just saw this, yeah, that picture, the one under the architecture diagram um, with Which one? The database and all that. Maybe, maybe if you can spend some extra time, I think some of the people in the audience may be interested in, yeah, in this. Uh, okay. this flow. Yeah, so maybe could we just touch on this exactly? What what exactly are we looking at with this? So this is more like a an organization setting. Mm -hmm. Your your where, where your role is as a GIS um, developer or maybe GIS analyst, for example. So you know, in, a, in, a, uh, in an organization, you have a project manager. We have um, UI UX DevOps. So you know, they work hand in hand. Well, let's say this is you, a GIS developer right here. And what that means is you should not, you are, you are expected to know to you know, write some front end codes and back end, but like a full stack. Mm. So if you want to do front end, you can select the popular frameworks out there React, Vue, Angular, Next, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You need to know it actually. You need to make the decision yourself and Select the one that you are comfortable with, but you just need to know how to present your maps. I mean, that one guy map this is built with HTML. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So this was static. And what is going to WebGIS now, where people can get to see and interact with maps. So that, that's when it becomes interesting. So you need to know how to present your maps, and that's where this language comes in. Then you need to you know, learn the GIS components part. That's the likes of leaflets. You know, open layers, map box, like the one I, I, I used to for the um, Futsal Guide um, website. The Google Maps API as well. They have an API if you want to use their API. If you if you can afford it, why not? That's, you know, presenting your maps. So at the back end, there are some things that happen at the back end. They have APIs. You yeah. know, they communicate together. So you need to know how to you know, write back end APIs as well. So, GeoJango, Node, if you are compatible with JavaScript, mm -hmm. or use Node and Express. PG Feature Serve, it's like a lightweight API for communicating with the database. So this one is written in Go, Go programming mm -hmm. language. Then we have Fast API written in Python. You know, and a lot of them like that. So when you have data in database, as an organization, you collect data. Let's say, for example, my, um, Let's say I work in a in the finance industry, in a bank, for example. I have locations of customers and other attributes data, like the address and the likes in this database. Right. So let's say my boss wants to, you know, wants to get the like, okay, Emmanuel, give me the locations of all, all our customers in in Lagos. Mm -hmm. And what you have is just a database of all your customers across the country, not even in Lagos or you know. 
not segmented. So you need to do some queries to the database. So you can do those at the back end, like you know, with GeoJango, so as to make it flexible. So when you do it with GeoJango, Node, or any of these lang uh, languages, you present it in a very nice dashboard, such that they just filter. You want to find customers in Lagos, just type Lagos, or you click on Lagos, then you see the results. So that makes it interesting. But you, you know at the back end that you have written some you know, SQL queries. Actually, in GeoJungle, my name is right, much SQL, of course, it's, it has made everything easier. Just call some functions to make the queries to post this directly. Mm. But with Node, you might need to write some SQL. And so, you know, you know you've done the whole logic at the back end. Then you make it, you know, you're serving it via REST API to the front end where you consume it. Then you present it in a very nice dashboard or interface. Yeah. And, and so, these geo servers, that's what you're referring to before. So this just server is just um, is a web, you know we have servers. Mm -hmm. Everything let's say this uh, it is Amazon, this Oracle, Docker, all this platform as a service. When you are done building your apps, you push them there to you know serve your apps for you. So those are the servers. These are map servers. Maybe um, Nginx, uh, Apache, Tomcat. You know, those those servers. So just server helps us to serve your special data and map server as well. You understand? So mm -hmm. they 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 use something we call OGC um, web service, o o o OGC compliance protocols. So this OGC is more like uh, a group of companies coming together to you know, set some um, license, some rules on how to serve, you know, to share your special data. Yeah. So we have data in PostGIS. So what's the best way to share this data out there for people to use that? Like the one I just you know, mentioned, or we have data in PostGIS, what's the best way to present this data on the map? It look like something like this. So this is coming from a database, actually. It's not static. So something like this, it's like you zoom out, you see it uh, at a maybe country scale or something, uh, at a, a, a global scale. So this thing is not st static. It's coming from a database somewhere. So what's the best way to serve this data from the database to the client to make it interesting and you know, interactive? So that's what these OGC services are for. So we have different services like web feature service. So that one helps us to serve stuff like this. These are, these are vector files, like these are vector layers. So more like a rep representation of, of reality. You know, yeah. this is like a polygon, for example, what's a polygon? So it represents that, okay, this Bono states. It's not like you're seeing, seeing Bono, you're not seeing Bono. Just showing you the boundary of Bono, yeah. the polygon. Yeah. So that's what vector files are. So that's what we use WFS for, web feature service to serve vector files. Then we have WMS to serve raster data. So raster data, are, you know, pixel, tessellated data, images like you know PNGs, JPEG, TIFF, GeoTIFF. So in GIS, what we use TIFF, GeoTIFF, cloud optimized GeoTIFF. Those are raster layers. So like the Google map I showed you the uh, earlier on, um, like that's Google satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. Those are raster layers. Yeah. It's not vector, you know, you can get to see an actual stop on it. You can get to see that, okay, this is this, this is a building, this and that. So that one is WMS, um, that one is a TMS actually. There are a lot of protocols, time map service, web map type service, you know, <laughs> vector ties, WMS, we have WPS. Web processing service. So that will allow you to process data, you know, make requests to data on the to raster data actually uh, on the web GIS. Then we have web catalog service. So that one helps to, you know, all this data they have metadata. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. one, like yeah. we, there are just a lot of OGC APIs that you can um, you can read, read read about to to now to share data. So you can't just be sharing data without taking into cognizance those services and protocols, understand? Yeah. So those are the services that are, that are binding, the best practices that are binding where we share data in the GIS world. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I there's a That's what GeoServer does actually. It's supposed to, to, to save data. So you connect your GeoServer to PostGIS, GeoServer gets data from PostGIS and send it to you via an API. So when you fetch this from the API, and present it on the map. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just about 
Yeah, yeah, I, I think this is very useful and um, there's a lot we've also covered. Um, what, what would be, you know, something like maybe um, for the next few minutes, what, what is like a good starting point for anyone who wants to get into this? And also like, where can they find more about your work? Like what, what's something you would advise to anyone who's just starting? Yeah, you know, um, GIS is very interesting and the community is very supportive. So if you want to start with the GIS, um, like GIS programming, mm -hmm. you have to start with the basics of GIS. You need to understand GIS. You know, I can see the way I was giving you some ex examples of you know, applications of GIS because I understand what GIS can do so I can get to relate it. So when you understand GIS, then you learn programming with it. Innovations will surely, will surely arise. Get to innovate. Get to, because you know that GIS can be used for this thing. Even if you want to build just a simple app, you will surely find a way to put GIS there because location matters in everything you do. Yeah. So understand the basics of GIS, what GIS can do, what GIS cannot do. Understand projections, like what I what, what I uh, what I said earlier, all these web map services, OGC services, you need to understand it. Mm -hmm. You need to understand services, protocols, the best practices guiding on GIS. You understand? So all anything you work on, anything you build will be your global standard, industry standard. So understand those ones. Then you're gonna go into programming, front end, you need to know HTML, CSS, JavaScript, React, if you want to. Um, Google to React, Vue, Angular, they all have their own learning curve. So you get you get to make the decision yourself. So yeah. you need to understand. I, the, the thing is, even if you understand JavaScript, so understand leaf layers, open layers, Marbox, they are just APIs. So it's so easy for you to pick up. So if you want to go into front end, I'm sure you understand JavaScript very well. HTML and CSS is very easy. So you should not spend much time on it. JavaScript is very easy as well, but you need to you know, spend some time on it for you to understand your concepts. When you understand the concepts, when you are consuming APIs like this, the map box and the likes, it's only difficult for you. But when you want to write API with Node, it's only difficult for you. Understand? So if you are coming from a Python background, just start from the back end, GeoJango, build APIs. And the beauty of it is you can build APIs for normal software applications that don't even take location into you know, consideration. So you can build normal REST API with um, Django, GeoDjango. So, so when you move from there, you start entering databases. You know, the moment you even touch backend, you start communicating with database, the Postgres, MongoDB. Yeah. The reason why I put Postgres here is because it has a lot of special functions like Mongo and document-based database, can't really do much just special stuff with MongoDB. But with PostGIS extension to PostGIS, you can do a lot. You can make a lot of queries, like a lot. Even some people call PostGIS a GIS itself without the GIS, because you can write some complex SQL queries that will help you to solve what you want to solve, like your problem, get it solved, without even opening a GIS software. It's just SQL. Like very, like it's very, very interesting. So that means you get to learn this as well. And you need to give yourself, you know, set goals. Don't rush yourself. I started learning back in when, it was in the last year, during the lockdown. So, you know, I, I, I had the time frame that, you know, I, I know I'm still, I'm still in school. So I was like, I want to learn this thing very fast before school resumes. So I started three months target. Wow. I, you know, I told you I've been learning Python since 2017. So even 2018, 2019, I moved to data science to explore the world of data science. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So explore and see how I can apply GIS to it. And from there, I got to learn a lot of stuff as well. Then I went to back end to build APIs for GIS. So I had the time frame of three months. So I already write Python, so it was easy for me to pick up um, GeoJango. And I understand GIS as well. So using the API documentation was very easy. So the thing is just understand the basics. Yeah. Front end, understand the basics. Back end, understand the basics. When you have a taste of the two, you yourself, you know what you want to work on. You know the one you like. When I tested front end and you know, building APIs and the likes, my interest in data science 
got reduced. <laughs> in data science, I was always writing, you know, writing models, making predictions on raw data, you know, mm -hmm. charts, mm -hmm. cargo competitions, data science Nigeria, this and that. <laughs> Very interesting stuff, you know. When I tested front and back end, I got to see that, wow, I could do a lot more with this. This, this is so sweet. So that was why I just say, okay, let me just invest most of my time here. So when you have a taste of these technologies, you know where to, where to focus on. Yeah. But just start somewhere. Start from the first, um, for front end, start from basics. Back end, start from basics. And for GIS generally, get books on GIS to read about, um, to read up on GIS. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of GIS softwares I never mentioned. We have QGs. We have ArcGIS, but I don't want it to be software driven, a solution driven. Just use anything that, that works. You know, that's what I would say. Use whatever works and, you know, scalable. So don't say you want to, because you have been hearing ArcGIS, ArcMap, QGIS, ArcPro, not sizing them. Don't jump into them. Understand the basics of GIS, how GIS works. Then I would highly recommend you go into uh, tech. As GIS development, because you know, of opportunities in that aspect, like a lot, because you read a lot. That's just it. Like yeah. this big picture stuff, I just got to know. I did a lot of research before I saw it. It's not like someone told me about it. So I listened to a lot of news, a lot of podcasts, a lot of articles, just to keep, keep myself updated on what's happening in the GIS development space. Yeah. And that's for myself, it interests me. It's my lot interest you so. But then just keep learning. Um, learn the basics, very important. The basic is very, like, the fundamental is very important. Yeah. Very, very important. Don't need to disturb yourself with complex stuff. Just when you know the fundamentals, you will know where you want to go next already. Yeah. Very sure that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's, I don't know how, how else that could have been said, you know, put, understanding the fundamentals and also, you know, trying out different things before finding out what you want. And they're not doing what is hyped, you know, not going with what is hyped, going with what actually works for your use case. You know, most times you have, a, there's a lot of solution driven um, uh, projects, solution driven uh, products. And so, like, you know, they're trying to force some technology onto a problem that doesn't yet exist or doesn't ex exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, uh, these things you said, is, is are, are, they resonate with, um, several other areas of software development so it's funny like irrespective of what's going on it's still the same thing in different aspects of uh, software development yeah that's that's correct all right yeah so i think uh this, this has been a really good uh really good show i, I personally learned a lot as well and um where would you say people yeah. can find you thank you what do you say uh where, where would you say people can find you maybe on twitter or, or yeah I'm social a lot. <laughs> I'm active on social media. This is my Twitter account. I, I tweet a lot. There are some accounts here. Yeah, yeah. I'm a forever learner. I'm a full stack display developer with special interest in community development. Like, I do it a lot. I, I enjoy it. Yeah. It's my past footer. Yeah, I start today's uh, career. Developer students, uh, students club, DSN, any community. I, I love it a lot. Uh, I like at least this way I know. I like sharing it to people. Mm -hmm. This is my LinkedIn profile. Uh, I'm also active on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. This is my account here. Then my old website. I'm not really had time to improve on it, bro. <laughs> this is my website here. Yeah? <laughs> oh nice so yeah it's about me you can read about my vision goals objectives my cv my little experience you know community development like volunteering i like to volunteer a lot then i, I write blogs as well so that's my website then i have a podcast even what you asked about gis development we had an episode about it last month with Van Joey. This is it. And inside into web GIS development with Van Joey Kiboy. Mm -hmm. So this is my podcast website with my co-hosts, Omo Wanola Kintola and uh, our podcast editor, Faith Kenny. 
So subscribe to our podcast to listen to more. We are targeting African talents. Yeah. You can see it here. Yeah. We reach out to people that are doing great things with Africa and, and with GIs in Africa, and we interview them. We bring, bring them on board to ask them what you know they're using GIs to solve problems in Africa. Yeah. But this is my podcast website. I also developed it myself. <laughs> Yeah, I can see the uh, the light and dark toggle on the top left. Yeah, yeah. dark mode. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because I saw you saw it on the foot yeah. map, uh, it's my yeah. footer guide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, that was why I used to that was I used to learn how to use light and dark mode. Mm -hmm. You know, I like learning with projects, so yeah, yeah. that's why I, I, I used to learn. So the code is also on open, on GitHub on my GitHub account. The code base is there. So subscribe to our um, podcast to get to know more about you know, what GIS is in Africa, who are doing what with GIS, and you know how they are using GIS to to solve problems. I used the next GIS for this one. Okay. Okay. Use next for this for this one. So yeah, you know, that's also an opportunity for me to explore. I just like building projects to learn something, and I want to learn. I build projects. Yeah. Now I want to learn something today. I build projects. Yeah. So and um, that's how we recommend if you want to learn anything, just build projects with it. No matter how little or small, just build something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No matter how little or small, just build something. Yeah. Or if you can't build it, just write about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's another way to write, write about it. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Emmanuel. This has been uh, really insightful and um, I'm sure many people who are watching this will really learn a lot about uh, GIS. And um, I'll add the links and descriptions to each of the uh, pages we've looked at today in um, the description of this video. So thank you everyone for watching. Thank you, and your, uh, Emmanuel. Thank you, Emmanuel, for joining. Well, thank, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm, I'm deeply grateful. Uh, that's, that's all I really good. appreciate it. Yeah, we're just uh, we're just showing uh, the talent that already exists in Africa, making sure that we tell the story so that people know that the the, yeah, the, the, the skill sets exist in the continent. People need to know that. Uh, so, yes. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much, and everyone have a nice day. I will see you on the next time. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, share this video, and comment down below uh, what you think about uh, today's episode. See you and have a nice day. Bye. Yeah, bye. <laughs> Subscribe. <-o. laughs> <laughs>